as a fair warning, I feel like this is reasonable based off the first service. There's a lot to write down. So, fair warning. 18% of all adults, that's 40 million people in the United States, have a medically diagnosable anxiety disorder. That is, they meet all the criteria, and whether it's diagnosed or not, there's 40 million people, roughly 20% of any, any group of people has a medically diagnosable anxiety. That is, it goes beyond worry or concern. It goes, it goes into uh, medically diagnosable. One in every three children and teens, so from age three to 17, by the time they're 18, so 30% roughly, by the time they're 18, will meet the criteria for a medically diagnosable anxiety disorder. And that number has risen pretty quickly in the last few years. What's really interesting, I, I, I thought it was interesting, in, in the teenage years, our, our teenage girls suffer at much higher rates than our teenage boys. Mostly because boys don't know what emotions are other than anger at that point, I guess. They're developing. But uh, you can see the trend, and anxiety is growing in society, whether that's rumors of war, whether that's personal health, whether that's anxiety about uh, the future of my family or my future in general. or uh, There's any number of things that we spend time being worried and anxious and concerned about. When we look at uh, how it kind of makes you feel, like anxiety, if you sit in it, it can become pretty overwhelming. It can become exhausting. The desire to avoid pain or negative circumstances can lead us, can lead us to attempt to control in our lives every possible situation, right? And so we work, uh, you know, I'm going to exhaustively make sure that my husband, and my husband does this and my wife does this and our kids do this. And so we're going to try to exert as much control on our lives as possible to mitigate or to remove or to lessen any chance of really being hurt. And here's what we know, like, you can't actually control things, but the effort of that is utterly exhausting. We also know that anxiety and fear and deep frightening go together. That sometimes you can't even, uh, you just think about all the possibilities, pain, all the possibilities of outcomes, and, and you become paralyzed by fear. You know, one, one over here, uh, kind of the extreme of the anxiety of taking control and trying to do everything, like theologically what the Bible says, one of the roots of that is a lack of trust in God. Uh, that's not the only route, but it, it's saying, I mean, if, God's, if God's really not in control, then I need to take control. And, and the best way that I can minimize pain and sorrow is if I kind of move God off the throne and I become the God of my own life, trying to mitigate pain as much as possible. The other is just paralyzed by it, and you become uh, so, so kind of inwardly focused that, 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 the, uh, the, that God, God really, he says he's good and he would work for my good, but I don't trust him with my life. Because what if he does something that he thinks is good, but I don't like, that causes me pain? What if he takes my child? What if he takes my job? What if he does these things that cause me pain? There are three types of people when it comes to anxiety and worry. One, those who understand that they are anxious and uh, worried and concerned and are working to deal with it. The other is those who are anxious and don't know how to deal with it. Then there are those who lie and say they're never anxious and give us all anxiety. You know, it's interesting, like, you mentioned anxiety and worry and you begin to go through these different different areas where we could be worried or concerned. And what happens is we don't just think it in our mind, but we feel it like right here, or sometimes like right here, or sometimes right here, or sometimes right here. That, that our, bodies, our bodies have been made so that we can actually feel worry and concern. The limbic system is one of those things that, that fear and, and, and fright all kind of go together to give us these signals that we're, man, we're really worked up. 
which is why sometimes you gotta breathe in these things because the, our, bodies, our bodies are connected. And so what I wanna do today is I wanna drill down uh, on anxiety and, and so I know we, we've got a bunch of different experiences and you bring a bunch of different things and degrees to the fore and all that. What I want to do today is focus on like, the theological definition of anxiety, the biblical definition of anxiety. I understand there's myriads of others, and I want to, I want to look at some theological roots uh, of sinful anxiety. And then I want to look at what the Bible has to say about how, uh, what are some ways that we as Christians can love one another, and what are some ways that if we are struggling with this, how do we, how do we move forward in life in a way that would honor God? And so that's kind of where we're headed today, and you can see you're going to need more than one piece of paper, so if you want to get that out now... Uh, Good luck. So, Proverbs twenty two nineteen. This is Solomon writing to his sons, to those of us who read us, that he has written these things that your trust may be in the Lord. I've made them known to you today. I've made them known to you today, even to you. Uh, Solomon's reminding us, and I'm reminding us that the goal of these proverbs is to remind us of God and His goodness, what He's provided for us. That these are not just divorced from reality. They're not just commands or ideas that we are to say. They're 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 not really pointing the Lord. He's saying, these proverbs remind you of who I am. So we move our eyes up to who God is and how He's designed us, especially when we're talking about anxiety. A proverb is not meant to be exhaustive. And we're going to see today, uh, this proverb that's got a problem and a solution, it's one of many possible solutions the Bible offers. We're going to dive deep into it, but I, I want us, if you're here and say, I want an exhaustive, I want an exhaustive way to deal with uh, anxiety in 45 minutes. No. Sorry. Our verse this morning, we're going to read it, but what's going to pop off the page is this main point. That a good word can lift a heavy burden. A good word can lift a heavy burden. The, the weight of this, of this sermon, the weight of it, the, really the weight of it, is how do we love one another? 59 one another's in the New Testament. What does it look like to love one another well in this really hard area? How do we speak to one another? How can our good words lift a burden on our brother and sister? How do we do that in a way that glorifies God? Proverbs 25 or 12, 25 says this. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Solomon's making a couple observations here. and He's noting this problem. Uh, the problem is this, that anxiety causes the heart to to sink. This is an observation that, that Solomon in all of his experience kind of just sees. It's a human experience. That we all know we've had friends, we've experienced this, that, that when we are overly or excessively concerned, our heart begins to melt, sink, bow down. The Hebrew word for anxiety is a kind of mashup of two words to emphasize something. It's a, it's a mashup of the word fear and the mashup of the word concern. And, and it's doing that to create uh, this picture that is consistent in the New Testament that, that when we talk about anxiety, when, when Paul says in Philippians 4, do not be anxious, this command, it's not saying don't have concern for things. Don't be concerned about your bank account. Don't be concerned about your kids. Don't be concerned about your husband and wife. Don't be concerned about your job. No, that's not what they're saying. That's not what Jesus is saying when he says don't worry. Jesus and Paul and Solomon are saying, listen, there is an element to our lives that just includes concern and worry and fear that is just part of being a human. And then there is part of concern and fear uh, and, uh, and anxiety that moves beyond this passing thing in our life but becomes consuming. And so anxiety, uh, anxiety biblically it's not just concern, it's excessive concern. It's not just worry, it's consuming worry. It's not just fear, it's unchecked fear. It's the next level, it's, it's here's, here are these problems and I'm actually going to try and solve them and it makes it worse. And so if we were to define anxiety biblically, it would look something like this. Anxiety is an undue or excessive fear of outcomes that are uncertain, that would be painful. You could say, or negative, either way. That it's not, uh, the Bible does not believe, Jesus did not teach this, Paul did not teach this, that concern and worry are sinful. 
It's the excessive and the undue. It's the consuming, uh, consuming nature that these things can have pretty quickly that becomes sinful. And here's why. Because when Jesus says, don't worry about anything, he's saying, I'm in control and I can provide for you. I'm good. And so at the, at the source of theological, uh, when, when we're talking about sinful anxiety or anxiety that is sinful, it's this excessive, undue um, over-concern that, that believes one of two things, two lies. One, that God is not in control and that he is not good. And we see this, uh, these are the two pillars that we must believe we must hold to, that we must remind ourselves of every day. If we are to fight anxiety with any kind of biblical, holy thrust, that it starts with recognizing that God is on the throne, and that gives us security. That nothing surprises him. Nothing's, nothing kind of comes out of nowhere. That he's not up there worried about how things are going to work out. He's got this. And that, that he desires our good, and that he is good in himself, and he works for our good. Anxiety, concern, fear are not sinful in and of themselves. But when they become undue, they, be, they kind of betray things that we believe wrong about God and things that we believe wrong about who he is. And I just want to put a caveat here because I think this is helpful when we're talking about sin. There is an extreme of anxiety disorders. Think like PTSD. You think OCD. And, and what I'm not saying is I'm not saying if you have PTSD, you live in a state of sin. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that in that state, you are going to be more prone, because of that particular disorder, to, to have thoughts that lead down that road. And so I, I, there's a lot to, I don't have the ex expertise to really get into that, but there's a lot there. And I, I don't want you to leave saying, man, I have PTSD or I have OCD. Or I have something that's really severe, and so I am in a state of sin constantly. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that if you're in those areas, it's going to be more difficult for you to discern. You're going to be more vigilant with faith. Be more vigilant with trusting God in new ways. Solomon is making a human observation about the effects of sin. I'm sorry, the effects of uh, anxiety. It weighs him down. And Solomon, Solomon is this guy who, who runs a whole nation, has 20,000, 2,000 wives, and has got all this stuff. He's a man who would be prone to anxiety. And he's saying to himself, that wasn't a wife joke, that was just... An observation, just the Hebrew word is that anxiety presses down a man's heart, compresses it. Now, all I could think of was a, an orange juicer, an orange, you know, one of those hand orange juicers, and just the life is being drained from somebody. We've seen this, we've experienced this. Solomon's point is this, that uncontrolled anxiety creates burden, not relief. Because I, I think what we tend to do is we think, if I just worry about this enough, it will actually create relief. But Solomon says the opposite is true, that when we see people who are consumed with fear, with worry, with concern, we actually see that it makes it worse for them. That what, what they're hoping to generate, uh, uh, generate some sort of change, generate some sort of holiness, only creates burden and sorrow. This is what Jesus notices in Luke 12. And which of you, by being anxious, that is again, unduly concerned, excessively fearful, can add a single hour to the span of his life? Je Jesus is just pointing out the futility of this kind of consuming anger or consuming anxiety, this consuming fear. That it doesn't actually produce what it promises and we end up more weighed down and more discouraged. And a lot of us can relate to these feelings, feeling fearful of a diagnosis that will end in death, feeling fearful of a diagnosis that will never come, you'll always be sick, feeling fearful that our kids won't ever come to know the Lord, or feeling fearful that our kids won't ever come back to know the Lord, or feeling fearful that, that our loneliness will never leave, we'll always be alone, or feeling fearful that God is waiting for us to mess up so he can finally rid himself of us. We're either consumed by these fears or we work to fight them. Solomon moves in the second half of this proverb to the answer. The problem was that anxiety causes the heart to sink. His second observation was a good word lifts the heart. Now for you Bible scholars, for you Bible readers, uh, that he starts with the word but, which is a what? Contrast. 
And so when we see that, we know that the author is comparing two different things. The first half is a negative, a negative observation. When I see people who are, who are anxious, it is this. It produces this negative. He says, but, and so here comes the positive, but a good word makes him glad. A good word makes him glad. Now, if we're going to understand what it means to really apply this, we have to pause for a moment and ask ourselves the question, what is a good word? We're in church, so obviously a good word's the Bible. Right? Like, like, okay, great, they're totally true, there's, there's a lot of good words that are of the Bible, but I, but I think as we look at this proverb, it's, it's not just theological, but there is a relational component to being part of the church. There's a relational component to one anothering each other, to loving each other. Because here's what I know, uh, we, we mask Good words, we're really bad at that. Hey, you're really anxious about that. Oh, don't worry about that. Man, you really, you think too much. Just, just live your life. I mean, it's, at least you're not as bad off as that guy. Right, we paint our own silver lining. Or sometimes we'll just throw as many Bible verses at it and one of them, will you stick? You know, God loves you, he, he created everything. And Don't you know that he works for you? Would any of that work? I want to just pause here because what we're going to do is I want to look in a little bit at what it looks like to speak to each other well that creates connection. Because I can't think of anything worse than to be consumed by fear or anxiety or concern and have to feel like that alone, which doesn't help. And so what I want to do is I want to kind of work us through, and this husbands and wives, moms and dads, what I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you a framework from grace to truth that will help you engage to know your kids, to know each other, to, to engage in ways that create opportunity for those verses, those theological truths, to take deeper root. So, here's a couple of different good words as we uh, kind of process it. There's relational good words, which are the words that we use with each other. How can we actually be friends? What does it look like to grow uh, together in a way that, that, that develops strength? A relational good words help us, aid us in bearing one another's burdens. That if we're not able to talk to each other and know and be known, that bearing one another's burdens is difficult. It also helps us with mourn with those who mourn. That if we can say the right things, if, if we can be present in the right way and, and be friends in the right way, biblically, we can mourn deeper and with more love. These relational things we're going to go through are the soil in relationship where God's truth can bear deep and grow root, can bear fruit, can bear fruit and grow deep. And we know the word of God is living and active and powerful, whether we do this well or not, but it is really powerful in the context of a good, strong, believing relationship. The second kind of words is theological good words. These are truths from the Bible and truth about, from the Bible about God and truth from the Bible about us. These are truths that we're going to quote to people, truths that we pray over people, truths that we encourage people to hold on to, like Jesus is coming back. This is not as good as it gets. Amen. Truths we challenge our people to live out, like he has told you to live this way and there's joy apportioned for you if you do that. And so I want to help you do that. There's a whole bunch of good words theologically. And honestly, as a preacher, like, that's just easy for me, but it's not always the best first step. Because sometimes people just want to know, are you with me? Because if I can be with somebody, those words go deep. So, here are some relational good words. I've adapted this uh, from John Townsend's book, People Fuel. I would recommend it for you. It's, it's good and helpful with what it looks like to develop strong friendships. And so as we look at this, uh, at the top of these, we're going to go from grace to truth. What I'm saying is if we start at the top and, and kind of work our way down, by the time we get to truth, we've developed a relationship that can bear the weight of hard truth. That, that can bear the weight of what, we're, of what God is working through us. And so uh, the first word uh, for, for relationships, relational good words, is acceptance. Acceptance. Where you're saying to them, hey, I think that makes sense. I, it, it sounds like you're scared. Rather than saying, you shouldn't be scared, that's stupid. Which is, you know, kind of our tendency if we don't relate with something. And what we're saying here is, man, I accept you as you are. I'm not judging you. I want to be here with you. I'm not leaving you. That's acceptance. The second is encouragement. 
It's on the gray spectrum. You want to let them know that you're there and say, hey, I actually, I know this is hard, but I believe you can do this. I know, I know it seems insurmountable, but I'm here with you, and I believe by the grace of God you can do this. You can validate what someone is feeling. This, uh, in, in my line of work, this is the most powerful tool I have most of the time. People come in, they, they, they've taken a long time to get to me, they've, they've languished in anxiety or worry or concern or whatever it is, and they come in and they don't say, hey, pastor, I need you to tell me I'm not crazy, but when I do say, hey, you're not crazy, that makes sense to me, it's like a, a burden was lifted because someone said, yeah, that actually makes sense why you would feel that way. You can validate feelings. You can bring hope. Hey, this can change. It can get better. This doesn't have to stay this way. Like, I believe what the word of God says. I believe on what redemption promises. This can and, and will get better. And you know, even if you can't see it, that's what I'm here for. I'll see it enough for the both of us. We can celebrate. This is my favorite. You get to be a cheerleader. Like, look how you've worked through this. You're growing in this area. I was at a counselor once, and uh, this was earlier in our marriage, and uh, I was describing, I, I like, felt like I was in, the, in a deep hole. And I'd been with this counselor for a few weeks and describing other things, and he's like, listen, you're not in the same hole. It looks like it because it's dark. But this is a different hole than you were in 10 steps ago. You got out of that hole and fell into this one. You're making progress. <laughs> and that was incredibly helpful to me. To know this wasn't the same hole. Hey, look at what you're doing. You're, you're, you're moving. You can affirm. Look how you reached out for help. This is a great step. Someone calls you and says, hey, I, I just need someone to talk to. Can you listen? One of the easiest things you do, hey, I'm so glad you called. Like, I, I'm so glad that you would do that. What a great first step. And I'd love to help you. You can clarify. Let's take some time uh, to try and get these thoughts organized. That people who are consumed with anxiety, worry, and fear, like it's just all kind of out there in this big amorphous blob and it's a bunch of fear and, and everything bad that can happen. Well, let's write some of this down. Let's see if I can't help organize this for you so we can get our hands around this. You can help give perspective. Hey, you, you, you've given me a couple situations that are pretty dire, but I, I think there's a couple ways it could work out where the world wouldn't end. Now, most of us will start down a perspective and say, well, you don't need to think that way. Here's a hundred different reasons why that won't work. Next one. Insight. We say, I, you know, I think, I think your concern about that may be connected to your eating habits or connected to something else. What you're saying is, I actually see the whole picture and I want to offer some more insight I've looked at this, I've heard you. I think these things may be connected in a way that you're not seeing. Does that make sense? You can also push someone to change. I think you need to change the way you're thinking this through. Again, grace to truth. Most of us start truth to grace, and it doesn't work very well. Because someone comes to you hurting, someone comes to you uh, in anguish, and you're like, hey, just stop being in anguish. Super thanks. Like, that's very helpful. I'll just do that today, right? Like, building this relationship helps get you to the point where you can say those things and be received in a way which moves to holiness and change. So, some theological good words that are worth uh, writing down and remembering. God is in control. God is good. God desires to hear from you. God saves. God desires your honesty. There are tons more, tons more that you could write down. But I think these, uh, these five have been instrumental in, in my counseling, in my life. Uh, the, the first two pillars, God is in control. Uh, he is on the throne. He does whatever he pleases, Psalm 135, 6. God is good, Exodus uh, 34, 6. The Lord, the Lord God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. These are, uh, church, these are the two pillars. God is good and God is, uh, God is on the throne. These two pillars are what make sure that as we're helping people, as we're helping ourselves, that we are doing it from a theologically right and godly perspective. If these two things are out of whack, we won't end at the right place. God is in control. 
God is good. God desires to hear from you. Psalm 120, verse 1. In my distress, I called out to the Lord. He answered me. People with excessive fear or concern or anxiety are in distress. It's good to know that they can call out and be heard. The Lord doesn't go, ah, that's not a nice enough prayer. You're not happy enough today. It's in distress you cry out. And he hears. God saves Psalm 88.1. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you. Night, I cried out day and night before you. That if we want the peace that transcends understanding, we've got to understand first that, that God has promised us peace only through Jesus. That, that if we don't have peace with God, we will never experience the peace that transcends understanding. That if we don't understand that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and made peace with God, if that's not foremost in our mind, then all of our attempts to help bring peace will be short-lived and temporary. Finally, God desires your honesty. Psalm 43, 2. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? This is a psalmist. He's a man of God. Saying, Why have you rejected me? We need to learn how to swear without swearing. We need to learn how to speak in anger without sinning. God is not afraid of who we are. He knows us and desires that kind of honest, frank relationship. You got these truths? What is the easiest way to, to, to use these? Is to say this. Can I pray for you? If you need to write that down, you can. That rather than preach, rather than give some treatise on theology... Minister to them and pray this over them. God, we recognize you are in control. God, we know that you are good and long-suffering and just. God, we know that you desire to hear from us and that you answer us. God, we know that you save. God, we know that we can bring all that we are to you. And so would you be here right now? Pray them over the person. Proverbs 17.7 says this. A friend loves at all time and a brother is born for adversity. That God has created the church as a means of grace for each other. That he has given us his word, he's given us his son, and he's given us the spirit, and he's given us each other. That we would use the word of God. We would use relationship to minister and to administer God's grace to one another. A friend loves at all time and a brother is born for adversity. This is why we do missional communities. This is why we desire you to, to come here on Sundays, but also to meet together in these smaller groups. Because we want to be a church that is real and authentic. But man, that is wasted. That authenticity is wasted if no one ever moves us to holiness. And so we want to create the type of relationships where we can know and be known and to apply the glory and the work of God so we can move in holiness together, however slowly, however quickly, but together. The essence of what Solomon is teaching is this, a good word can lift a heavy burden. If this is true, and I believe it is by experience and by the word of God, I want to give us something we do to help ourselves and help others. If you want to help others, the best thing you can do is start practicing these relational good words. Uh, if you've got a friend, if you've got a husband, if you've got a wife, if you've got a kids, Begin saying these things. Begin practicing and listening and being present, which means you've got to put your phone off. It means you've got to stop thinking about what you have next and be a part of that conversation. Listen to how they're doing, what they're saying, and how they're feeling. Be a part of that grace continuum that leads to truth. Practice theological good words. And what I mean by that is familiarize yourself with the word of God. And look, like we're not, I'm not asking you to memorize stuff, but if we're in a position where someone's anxious and we're typing in Google, how to stop anxiety, Jesus. <laughs> you don't have to be a scholar, but have something. I've given you five things you could bring relatively easily that will remind. If you're sitting here and saying, you know, I need a good word. But I don't know who's going to help me. I don't know what to do. I want to give you a framework, and then we are almost done writing and almost done preaching, okay? I want to give you a framework that kind of builds out. 
Because this is one aspect, that a good word uh, lifts a spirit. But it's not all that we need to know about how to process this. And so I just want to quickly run through this, and then we're going to be done. Here's how you can be a part of helping yourself. Number one, these, number one and number two, these two go together. We've talked about it. If your foundation is not theologically sure, if you don't believe that God is in control and that he works for your good, then every attempt to grow, every attempt to help someone else is going to be faltered because your foundation is faulty. That for the Christian, if you want to be a part of holiness and sanctification and someone's godly progress, if you want that for yourself, then these are the first two things that you need to know and trust. And listen, I get that there are going to be times when you don't believe it. Like, I understand that. And I'm not saying, just trust harder, because I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but I do know that if the foundation, if, if we think that God is not in control, if we think that God is not good, then what grows from that will not be holy, will not be godly. Jerry Bridges said this, God never pursues his glory at the expense of the good of his people. In other words, God, God never pursues things that glorify him at your expense. That he's not a bully, he's not a cosmic bully. He doesn't bring himself glory by hurting you flippantly. Nor does he ever seek our good, give us things that we like at the expense of our glory, at his glory. He doesn't give us things because we're his kids that, will not, that, are, that are good for us but bad for his glory. That these two things are never in conflict for him. That he is good on the throne and he desires our good. Number three, pursue fellowship with God. Read your Bible regularly. Pray regularly. And there are going to be times and moments and seasons where you say, this doesn't work. I don't feel anything. Anything worth doing is worth doing consistently, whether you feel like it or not. Hello? Like, it's late January, which means most of us have given up our desire to eat good and work out, right? I didn't see the results, but we know anything worth doing, eating good, working out, is worth doing consistently, whether we know it or not. And listen, if you've got, if you've got a phone, Get the Bible app. I don't know, this is what it's called, the YouVersion Bible app. It's got plans on there for anxiety and worry, and some of them are really good. It's not like you have to guess and, and end up in Chronicles and say, what does God have to say about, about I, really, I really kind of rag on Chronicles all the time. I need to choose a different book. Uh, it's like you've got to guess. There's, there's a tool there that can help you process this. It's where you're going to learn in 1 Peter, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And do not be anxious. Uh, instead, give everything on prayer and thanksgiving, and you'll experience peace. Uh, these two things, I want to just say this really quickly. The Bible does not promise a life free from anxiety, worry, or concern. That would be prosperity theology. The Bible does not promise that. It promises a God who is present and brings peace in the middle of it. Charles Spurgeon, a uh, famous preacher in the 1800s, one of my favorite quotes and he was a man who struggled with anxiety and depression, said this, I have learned to kiss the waves that dash me against the rock of ages. I have learned to love those things that push me into Jesus, whether I like them or not. I love those things that, that produce in me that which I would not willingly produce in myself. A new love for Jesus. Number four. Get a good friend. Go make a friend. Here's what I mean by that. We all need someone in our lives who we can lay ourselves bare before. And it may not be your husband, it may not be your wife, but there may be someone in your life who you can say, I feel like I can tell them anything and not be judged and accepted, and I can walk with them in holiness. Find that person and say, hey, I'd like you to be a good friend to me. It's like asking someone out. And say, I'd like to meet with you like once a week. I, I'm struggling with this. Is there a chance I could just share this with you and, and allow you to help me process it? Uh, allow it and I, just, I just need someone who I can do this with. And I'll say this. If that person is on the phone, if you're thinking of someone who's like, my guy's in Florida. Like, that's my guy. I call him and I can talk to him about whatever. An A friend in Florida is better than a C friend in town. I got a bunch of A friends here. I'm not saying I don't have this. <laughs> but that's my guy. He's been my guy since college. Find a friend who you can do this with. Number five, create a healthy routine. Eat well, sleep well, uh, 
exercise. We are embodied souls. So our souls uh, have effect. We feel anxiety in our body. And so exercising regularly helps that. Finding a regular pattern of sleep. That doesn't mean you're going to sleep at that time. It's saying every night at 9, I'm getting into bed and turning off the phone. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set that pattern in my life. And I'm going to try to eat well so that I don't compound difficulties. Finally, evaluate, or number six, evaluate what we're taking in. What kind of relationships do we have? Are there people in my life who, who don't bring me anxiety but definitely don't build me up? Who are, like, who are neutral at best? And if there are people who are, anx- who are anxiety givers in your life, then maybe you need to create some limits on how you talk to them, when you talk to them, how you interact with them, to, in, in, in a sense, protect yourself. What habits do you have? What are you eating? What news are you taking? There's, there's, there's a guy who I was talking to this week who said, I had to stop watching the news because it, ri- it just rose up anxiety. You know, two weeks ago, this guy was saying, I thought we were going to go to World War III with Iran. I can't, I can't go up and down. So don't watch the news. You want the quickest, men and women, you want the quickest way to relieve some anxiety in your life, delete social media today. Like, except for our Church of the Gates webpage. <laughs> but seriously, I, gar- I always guarantee you that if you delete Facebook and Instagram a month from now, one, your life will be just fine. And two, you will care less about things you shouldn't care about at all. Finally, number seven, Pursue professional assistance. Go to your doctor and say, hey, man, I, I've been doing these things. I've got this foundation theologically. And if he's not a Christian, share the gospel with him. There you go. <laughs> I've got this foundation here. I've got a good friend who I'm talking with. I'm trying to eat right. I'm trying to exercise. I'm trying to sleep. And nothing's connecting. Let him kind of ask you some questions. And then find a licensed counselor who's a Christian. Go get some other help. Like, that is not a thing. Like, my wife and I do that from time to time. We've done that in their marriage. I recommend people, like, it is a good thing to go find someone who can help you process that. And I just want to say this. If, if the doctor and the counselor kind of come together and say, hey, it might help you if you take some of this medicine and that will help regulate some things that are kind of out of whack. Like, do it and don't feel shame. Like, if these are the foundations, that God is good and that God is in control, medicine doesn't have to control your life. It can be something you do that God uses in your life to organize thoughts, to bring you back to who he is. Like, there's no shame in that, I don't think. Trust in him, trust in his goodness, trust in his word, and trust in his people. You'll start seeing life for what it is, and God for who he is. And you'll start seeing anxiety and worry and concern for what they are. And in that process, you'll become more like Jesus. Let's pray.